Welcome to Baseball Seasons 1981, a season interrupted. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! The 1981 baseball season began like any other, with a feeling of rejuvenation permeating spring training. Fun to put the uniform back on and get the spikes in the grass, you know? The Phillies were coming off a long-awaited first-ever World Series title. The Philadelphia Phillies are the champions of the world. Well, we thought we were going to win it again. We were coming off an 80 World Series win when we thought we had things figured out. But other clubs across the NL also felt upbeat, including the L.A. Dodgers, even if the full extent of their potential wasn't apparent at the outset. The Dodgers have no Koufax Drysdale combination, but trio Steve Howe, Fernando Valenzuela, and Bob Castillo could make a difference in the bullpen. In the AL, the Brewers had also bolstered their bullpen in a blockbuster deal with the Cardinals that netted them a trio of key additions. The big deal that brought Fingers, Vukovic, and Ted Simmons to town really ignited a true pennant type fever. I was more than happy to go to Milwaukee at the time. They had a great team, you know, Robin Yao, Paul Mulder, Gorman Thomas, Cecil Cooper, Ogilvy. We were getting closer and closer to winning a division, and I know the 81 season, we entered that season believing that we had a legitimate chance of winning the division. But in the AL East, they'd have to contend, as always, with the Yankees, who hoped to make a massive addition of their own in the offseason. I remember going to New York City, and we entertained and had discussions with all the teams. Atlanta, Houston, and the Mets. And I walked out of the hotel I was standing at, and a guy was walking down the street, and he saw me. His eyes got so big, he forgot where he was walking. Man, he ran right into one of the signposts. Bam! He hit the sign, and after he recovered, he said, Dave Winfield, he said, doesn't matter which team you play for, Yankees or Mets, come to New York. We love you. And Yankee owner George Steinbrenner made him an unprecedented offer he couldn't refuse. But that left San Diego without their slugger. I think compensation though, basically is mandatory. When a team like San Diego loses a player of caliber they did, they're entitled to get something more than an amateur draft choice. And the issue of compensation for lost free agents loomed large in labor negotiations, with a deadline for a player's strike set for late May. Will there be a strike, or do you see a solution to this thing? That's a difficult question. I know that the players are ready to strike, and it seems that the owners are a little more united this year. I hope there isn't a strike. I hope there can be something resolved out of the situation with the compensation. The season would at least begin on time, and when it did, the Oakland A's started hot, playing a brand of baseball named for their fiery skipper. Billy Martin was the manager. There was a buzz in Oakland. Everybody was talking Billy Ball. Right now, it's all called Billy Ball. Led by leadoff man Ricky Henderson, who'd swiped an AL record 100 bases in 1980, the A's generated runs through aggressive base running and a powerful lineup. Not only did we hit home runs, we stole bases, we stole home. Murphy down the line at third. He might go. He is going. Here's the pitch. It gets away, and Murphy is stolen home. We're just creating runs and forcing things to happen. Billy Ball was also about pushing starters deep into games, leading to complete game totals almost unheard of for the era. He never did anticipate coming to take us out of ball games. Uh, when he would come to the mound, it was just to give us a breather or talk about a particular hitter. You knew that when he handed you the ball at the beginning of the game, you were going to be around to either win that yourself or, or lose it yourself. All the unconventional strategy led to a record start in AL history. It was the start of the season, and we had won 11 games. We broke a record, so it was very exciting because we were in first place. Back in the AL East, the arrival of the new superstar in the Bronx only solidified the Yankees' lofty goal to get back to the World Series after a two-year absence. Veterans who really knew how to play. Greg Nettles, Reggie, Gossage. Man, it's so much easier to win. It's so much easier to play. Did he get all of it? Holy cow, did he cream that one? Winfield and the Yanks would stay close to first place over the first month, though other clubs like the Orioles soon made it clear no one would coast to the playoffs. We had a pretty good ball clock in 1981 under Earl Weaver. He was emphasized mostly on good pitching and good defense and the three-run home. The 
chase for an AL pennant was on, but over in the NL, the headlines focused on a phenomenon like no other. The 1-1 pitch, a bouncing ball to the right side. Bergman has it, steps on first, and the Astros have won the National League West. After losing the 1980 NL West crown in a one-game playoff, the Dodgers came into the 81 season with a very clear goal. Considering what took place last year, it generates motivation, you know, an anticipation of playing in another World Series, and I think that's what our main goal is. Every year when we went into the season, all things being equal, we felt as though we were as good as anyone. And there was ample evidence for that conviction. NL pennant winners in 77 and 78, the Dodgers featured a veteran infield core that had been together since 1974. The Dodgers still had that great infield of, say, Russell, Lopes, and Garvey. They still had Dusty Baker. They still had Tommy Lasorda. They had a really good team, but they had Fernando. Fernando was Fernando Valenzuela, a 20-year-old rookie from Mexico who found himself unexpectedly on the mound opening day. Había lesiones en otros jugadores que iban a iniciar la temporada. Tommy Lasorda me dijo que un día antes que si podía lanzar al día la, la apertura del 81. I gave the assignment to Fernando, a young rookie, and did he pitch a good game? He pitched a great game. Fernando Valenzuela has opened the 1981 season with a shutout. And that was just the beginning. Armed with a devastating screwball. Swung on and missed strike three. Valenzuela earned victories in his first eight starts, hurling shutouts in five of them. Struck him out, all over, and Valenzuela did it again. He has this very distinctive style, the high leg kick, the eyes rolled back up toward the sky. There's something about him that people relate to, and he captivated the entire country. It was Fernando Mania. It was unbelievable. Every time it pitched, it was a huge, huge event. I think that Fernando Venezuela is the best. He's the greatest, and I think everybody here has Fernando fever. Fernando Mania quickly went national, but it also served as a catalyst for the Dodgers, who won 26 of their first 35 games to jump out to a commanding lead in their division. And that left other quality teams, like John McNamara's Cincinnati Reds, to play catch-up in the NL West. And this one belongs for the Reds! You still had some remnants of the Big Red Machine left in 1981. Johnny Bench, Ken Griffey, Dave Concepcion, George Foster still with the team. The offense was still clicking. They were scoring runs. And as the offense produced plenty of runs, ace Tom Seaver led the pitching staff. He was sensational. I mean, it was automatic uh, when he went to the mound, and he really conjured up memories of a young Tom Terrific. Swung on and missed. He got him with a high fastball. Although Seaver was enjoying a renaissance at age 36. Look him out. The Reds fell back in May and still had a ways to go to catch the Dodgers. In the NL East, the Expos started the 81 season an eager bunch. After losing the division in the final week of the season in both 79 and 80. We knew we had that behind us, and we had high expectations. We were still a fairly young team. I think even the, you know, the experts, you know, had picked us on paper to go all the way. And with one of baseball's best catchers in Gary Carter. A home run for Gary! And an emerging star, an outfielder, Andre Dawson. Look uh -oh. out! The team had plenty of firepower. But it was a rookie left fielder who brazenly stole a show in Montreal. Tim Raines came up, and he was a great catalyst for that team early on in 81. It'll be a straight steal for Raines. You needed a stolen base. Uh, nobody stopped him. While Reigns took off on a pace of more than a stolen base a game, his team still had to reckon with the reigning world champions. We know everybody's going to be gunning for us, but at the same time, we have confidence that we can win. Uh, we, we know that we've got a darn good baseball team. Out of here, home run, Michael Jack. Led by superstar third baseman Mike Schmidt, 
most of the World Series roster was back. And they weren't ready to relinquish their throne. The pitch to Wap. He struck him out. There it is. He doesn't like it, but that's it. But it was the surprising Cardinals who jumped out to an early division lead, with manager and GM Whitey Herzog employing his own signature style of play. We go into town, we play a ball, but they know that we're going to take the extra bases and uh, be playing an aggressive style of ball. Many people have referred to it as Whitey ball. I think it's Whitey Herzog's type of baseball. He built the team around speed, defense, and pitching. Swing and a miss. With new additions like Bruce Souter joining Cardinals mainstays George Hendrick and Keith Hernandez. What a play by Hernandez. The ball came up. They got him. Whitey Ball would keep St. Louis in first place for most of May. That's the winner. The Cards are back in first place. It was a chilly May night when Len Barker took the Cleveland Stadium mound. 26 outs later, he was on the verge of a pitching feat not seen in 13 years. Fly ball, center field. Manning coming on. He's there. He catches it. A perfect game for Lynn Barker. He has made baseball history here tonight. I, luckily, I had everything going for me. This is the way it is. You have to have luck in this game, and that's, that helped me. His magical night also helped the Indians maintain a slim lead in the tightly packed AL East. But as June began, Dave Winfield's Yankees were heating up. Fly drive down the left field line. He hit that like a 20 million dollar man. The Yanks would win their first nine games of the month to move from fourth to first in the division. That's it. The Yankees have won it again. Making a similar run in the NL were the Reds, who won seven straight to pull within a half game of the Dodgers. Swung on and missed. And that is it. But as the division races were taking shape, a bleak reality was looming. That time had just about run out to settle the labor discord between owners and players. The players set a strike date. They reached the deadline without an agreement. Nobody knew whether the season would resume or if that was the end of the season, and the players walked out. I don't think it'll hit me until a few days from now. Like I said, I've never had a summer without baseball. As the players packed their gear and went their separate ways, the reality sunk in. None of us had ever known a summer without baseball. It had been six years since the advent of free agency had created a new order in the game and a new set of vexing issues. The strike was all about the owners wanting to get compensation for, for free agents that the teams lost. They felt that any player at all could be made available if a team lost a free agent. And the Players Association certainly didn't want that. I was a player rep at the time and had a fairly close relationship with Bowie Kuhn, who was the commissioner. And I had told him when the strike started, I said, Bowie, the players are not going to give in. Uh, you might as well appeal to the owners and let's get this thing settled for the good of the fans. And uh, of course, that fell on deaf ears. Federal mediator Ken Moffat was brought in to try and bring the two sides together. But a month into the strike, there was no deal in sight. The owners committee, they advised us through the mediator that unless we, the Players Association, had a new proposal, they did not care to meet. For 51 days, we're out. And I remember just trying to, you know, doing my part as a player rep, holding guys together, keeping them together. And then, finally, a deal was reached. The central compromise, teams that lost top free agents could draft replacements from a pool of unprotected players across the league. Still, some couldn't help but notice the timing at the end of the strike. Ironically, the owners had 51 days of strike insurance, and then the strike ended. So it was something that never should have happened, and because of that, the season was split. And now, baseball officials had to figure out how to handle that split season. We have the option, and it's an interesting option, to decide to play a split season. The second half would begin uh, on the 10th of August. We'd start out every club 0-0 on the record, and you'd get down to a point at the end where you had a special tier of playoffs. So the champion of the first half of the season would play the champion of the second half in that special tier. And then you get the league championship in the World Series. It's an interesting idea, and, and we're going to take a good, hard look at it. Soon, it became official. The division leaders, when the season stopped, the Yankees, Phillies, A's, and Dodgers were in the playoffs. And now the season would start from scratch. And those first half winners would play whoever won the second half in an extra round of playoffs. As far as the split season is concerned, in retrospect and, and with, with no bias at all, 
um, I felt like it was probably the best solution to what was a real mess. And any concerns that fans would be slow to re-embrace the game after the strike were dispelled when the season resumed on August 9th with the All-Star Game in Cleveland. Well, what a tremendous opening to the All-Star Game here. Almost 70,000 people, maybe an All-Star Game record. A full house, and now baseball is back. It was kind of strange. The season restarted with the All-Star Game, and I don't know how many All-Stars were in really great baseball playing shape. I was lucky. I went 2-4 and uh, hit a home run off Tom Seaver. Look out. Hit deep to right center field. Way back. Way back. But in the eighth, Mike Schmidt also showed the layoff hadn't impacted his power. Straight away center field. Schmidt's blast was the difference as the NL won their 10th straight All-Star game. Ball game is over. National League wins it 5-4. Regular play resumed that week and history was quickly made as Schmidt's teammate Pete Rose passed Stan Musial to become the NL's all-time hit leader. Strike one pitch to Rose. Bounce through the hole. There was no question. Baseball was back. There were some imperfections to the split season of 1981, but St. Louis in second place and just a game and a half out when the strike was called was determined to make the best of it. When they picked up the schedule after the strike ended, the Cardinals had like 32 of their last 54 games were away from home, so they had a terrific disadvantage. We just felt, you know, we needed to go out there and, and get off to a good start and play hard. Curveball and a ground ball to the right side. That's a hit. Here comes Tennis trying to score. The throw home is safe. Like the Cardinals, the Brewers had narrowly missed winning their division in the first half and were looking to make a push in the second. When they decided to divide it into two halves, as close as we were to winning the first half, we knew we had a chance to win the second half. The Brewers were a certifiable offensive force throughout the summer, scoring the second most runs in the AL in the second half. They are one of the hardest hitting contingents in all of Major League Baseball. I would have hated to have to face our lineup in 1981. As far as being a relief pitcher, you know, I could go out and make a mistake once in a while and maybe give up a couple of runs. And with fingers 0.72 second half ERA, late inning Brewer leads almost always became wins. The last two years here we've lost a lot of ball games in the seventh on. Roy Fingers has given us the uh, confidence that we can fight for seven innings and come out a winner. Ultimately, Fingers was the difference for the Brewers, saving 16 of the team's 31 second half wins. In the AL West, the Royals had started the first half of the year terribly at 9-22. But with fresh optimism when the season restarted, the defending AL champs replaced manager Jim Fry in late August with Dick Hauser. I like the ball club. That's one reason I'm here. Every club has some problem, but I think all you have to do is look to what they did last year. And most of those players are still here, and you can see that's a good ball club. The thing that Dick Hauser brought to our ball club was a no panic type attitude, a guy who really felt like regardless of, of what the circumstances were, that we could overcome it. And I think that when you show that kind of confidence, players respond to that. Sure enough, the Royals got hot, winning six of their last eight to seize first place and set up an AL West divisional playoff with first half champ Oakland. Over in the NL, the Dodgers had had the Majors' best record in the first half, but the split season meant fresh slates for every team, including the Astros. For whatever reason, we just couldn't get things rolling in the first half, and I guess it was a blessing that we went on strike because it was a split season. We got things together the second half. A big part of Houston's second half success was its pitching, a rotation with the lowest ERA and third most strikeouts in the National League. When you have a rotation of that magnitude, it gives you an opportunity not to have prolonged losing streaks. And we weren't a ball club that scored a lot of runs, so I think our strength was our, our starting pitching. And their strong-armed ace was Nolan Ryan, whose career-best 1.69 ERA was tops in the league, 
and whose September no-hitter was remarkably the fifth of his career. He got it. All right. No-hitter number five. Congratulations to you. Good luck to you the rest of the way. It's an important game, not only for the no-hitter today, but what it means to your ball club, and I think you never lost sight of that either. Thank you. That game came in the midst of Houston's battle with the Reds for the NL West. The teams were separated by just a half game in the season's final week. But in the end, Cincinnati would be the hard luck loser of the split season format. They lost three out of their last four, finished a game and a half behind. And despite having the best overall record in baseball, they stayed home. Their 66 and 42 record was for naught. The organization was adamant that uh, this was not right and it was really unprecedented in many ways in baseball history. Before the last game was played, they had the whole team walk a banner onto the field. The banner simply said, Cincinnati Reds baseball's best record, 1981. Like the Reds, the Cardinals could boast of their division's best overall record, but not winning either half meant their season ended without a playoff berth. Manager Herzog was very upset as he called it the Bowie Coon sweepstakes. The darndest decision I've ever seen in baseball. We won our division, Cincinnati won their division, and neither one of us got in the playoffs. The Expos and the seven other postseason teams were to play in the first ever divisional playoff, with the first half winners battling the second half champs in a best of five series to advance to the LCS. There's pennant fever, not only in Montreal, but across Canada. <laughs> The Expos' march to the playoffs got a boost in early September when team executive Jim Fanning replaced Dick Williams as skipper. Dick Williams was as good a uh, baseball manager of a game that I've ever been around, and I was only around him probably for a year and a half. But I think what Jim did when he took over for us, I think he relaxed the club more than anything else. Guys went out and just played every night to win a baseball game. Under Fanning, the Expos won 16 of their final 27 games, edging out the Cardinals for their first playoff appearance in franchise history. I'll tell you, what's really exciting. It's been a long time since we've waited for this, baby. 1979, we lost out to the Pirates by two games, and in 1980, we lost out to the Phillies by one game. And now the Expos were presented with an opportunity for vengeance against the Phillies in their opening playoff series. We're just about set to go here at Olympic Stadium. The Expos against the Philadelphia Phillies. There was a hatred between the Phillies and the Expos going on. That was a pretty good rivalry there. Montreal played us tough all the time. Every time we played Montreal, it didn't matter what place they were in or what place we were in. Now, and on. The Expos certainly started the division series tough, winning the first two games at home to close in on a sweep. Fly ball, right field. He makes the catch. The ball game is over. The Expos have beaten the Philadelphia Phillies. But back in Philly, the defending champs would not go down easily. What a grab by Smith. Oh, what a play by Smith. A double play. And after winning game three, the Phillies tied the series in dramatic fashion in game four. Bukovic slams one deep right field. You never want to get a series down to one game, but when you drop the first two, you got to feel like you turn the tide a little bit. Oh, my! It wasn't to be. They went on and beat us. The Expos won game five, three to nothing, making them the split-season NL East champions. And now they would chase a pennant for the first time. The NL Division Series out west featured a matchup of division rivals, the Astros and the Dodgers, who shared the same strength. The Astros had good pitching and played great defense, and I think we matched them with the Dodgers with the same type of look. And game one unfolded predictably as a pitcher's duel between aces young and old. This is quite a matchup. The kid, Fernando, against the veteran flamethrower. This is strike three, swing and a miss, fuck him out. Five strikeouts for Ryan, five strikeouts for Valenzuela. Each starter was brilliant, yielding just one run apiece. And then in the bottom of the ninth, Lasorda went to his bullpen. And Ashby looked a long fly ball to right field. That's a home run. It's all over. The Astros win it. 
The trend of stellar pitching continued in game two, and the game was still scoreless when the Astros loaded the bases in the bottom of the 11th. Swung on and a line shot into right center field. Thomas on the run, can't get it. Astros win. But even on the verge of elimination, the Dodgers still felt they had a chance. Well, we were coming home, so we were playing in front of our home fans. And regardless of the situation, we were two down or whatever, it, it didn't really matter because we felt confident. We always felt confident. And their confidence was bolstered in an easy 6-1 win in Game 3. Then the next day, Valenzuela went the distance in another terrific outing. And suddenly the series was tied. We were down two to nothing, but the guys were really confident that they could come back here in our park. Thank God we're able to go into that fifth game. And in game five, the Dodgers finished their comeback behind Jerry Royce in a game that finished with a dramatic flourish. He's not running. He's not running to first. Now he's running to throw is just barely in time. And the Dodgers win the final score. For the Dodgers were in the NLCS for the third time in five years. In the AL West Division Series, the Royals, a sub-500 team overall in 81, were dominated by A's pitching from start to finish. Ground ball to the first baseman. Spencer's got it. Underhands to Norris, and this game is over as Norris allows only four singles and shuts out the Royals 4-0. The A's pitching was excellent, and the Royals could just never get anything going offensively. Fastball struck him out, swing! Beard has struck him out to end the ballgame, and the A's dug out a rough... While the A's swept away the West, the Yankees looked to do the same in the East against a team making its franchise postseason debut, the Brewers. We thought we had a pretty good chance in 81 to beat them, and they came to Milwaukee, and they beat us the first two games, and it uh, looked pretty bad for us. So we have a 2-0 lead coming back to Yankee Stadium, and all we have to do is win one ball game. We're feeling pretty good about ourselves. But in the eighth inning of game three, with a score tied at three, Paul Molitor changed the series with one swing of the bat. Well hit the left. Just to left at about 380 feet, and the Brewers are back on top, four to three. We had our suitcases packed, ready to go, and we had to go back to the hotel, and we won the game. And the next day, Fingers was called in to protect a two-to-one lead in the ninth inning of Game Four. Two outs. The tying run is at third. Now it's down to Fingers and Sorrell. The guy threw him four straight fastballs. He was right on him, and he fouled him back. Got to the next pitch, and Ted Simmons stuck down slider. And I said, okay, let's try a slider. He struck him out, and there will be another game tomorrow as the Brewers tie this series two wins apiece. The Brewers had drawn the series even. One game would decide who was moving on, which certainly didn't please the Yankees' boss afterwards in the clubhouse. I had struck out to end the game. Next thing you know, he's ranting and raving, and I, I thought he was talking about me, and... I confronted him. Which was a shocking event in itself because uh, whoever talked back to the boss. Thank goodness Bobby Mercer stepped in the middle of us and got in between us. And then George had what I called the General Patton speech. He said that the great Yankees would turn over in their graves if we lost the next day. We're getting set for game number five between the Milwaukee Brewers and the New York Yankees. We felt as though we had the momentum after beating the Yankees twice in a row in their ballpark. And we knew we had our hands full of Gidry. I've seen Gator in pressure situations before. Anytime you're in a game five, he's the guy you want with the ball in his hand. So we, we felt very confident. But in the second inning, Brewers slugger Gorman Thomas got to Gator. And Winfield, one by. Oh, it's gone. Thomas is on the scoreboard. The Brewers would make the lead 2-0 in the third against Gidry. But then in the fourth, with the tension at Yankee Stadium rising, Reggie Jackson came up. Reggie Jackson was not called Mr. October for nothing. Showtime for Mr. October in full Reggie Vision. A two-run homer to tie. His 16th homer in postseason play. With Reggie, you almost expect that. One swing of the bat could change the whole complexion of the game. Oscar Gamble followed with a cloud of his own, and Yankee bats were suddenly alive and well. The Bombers were up 4-2 in the fifth when Game 2 starter Dave Rigetti was called upon in relief on short rest to secure the series. 
I don't even think I gave signs when Rigetti came in. It was all fastballs. Rags used to get mad at me. I said, I love your fastball. These guys can't catch up to it. He did a tremendous job bridging the gap to Gossage. Deuce Gossage will lead Rigetti to save New York for the third time. And for the fifth time in six years, the Yankees were number one in the American League East. The way that series played out, it was a relief to get past them because we really felt like if we can get some momentum going and get the feel going, that we'd be a very dangerous ball club. Having hit their stride against the Brewers, the Yankees' next test would come from the A's and their formidable pitching staff. They had a great young staff. You know, you think about McCaddy and Langford and Norris. Akio. This is a nice young staff, and they knew how to pitch. But in the ALCS, the A's arms faltered at a series of critical points. Now the Yankees are off and running again in the first inning. The Yankees came up with big hits. High fly, deep left, way back, way back. It is a home run. They were better than the Athletics, and in their head-to-head -head series, uh, they demonstrated it. They I think it was more about experience against Oakland than anything else. We had the experience. We had guys that had been to the World Series before. Gustafi, two down. We went on a nice little roll there against them. And we swept them. The Yankees have won their 33rd minute and will be going after their 23rd World Series title. The Expos and the Dodgers begin the fight for the National League pennant. The 1981 NLCS featured one of baseball's most storied franchises against one of the newest. But the Expos had struggled in L.A. They have lost nine straight here. 18 of 19 here. Which gave the Dodgers some confidence. To play the Expos and start two ball games here, we're very, very optimistic. Especially with a starter going who'd been at the center of that success. Putin has won six of his last eight for Montreal. The last time they beat him was in 1979. And in game one, the Dodger dominance continued thanks to the play of L.A.'s vaunted infield with both the bat and the glove. Could be two. Say. The Lopes to Garvey. Double play. And then Say started the scoring soon after. Garvey goes. And it's a base hit to right field. And that may score Garvey. One nothing Dodgers on a double by Say. Pedro Guerrero later homered for insurance, and L.A. took the opener, setting up the Dodgers' rookie revelation for game two. Fernando Valenzuela pitched so well all year and pitched particularly well in the playoffs against Houston. But on this day, Valenzuela would be unexpectedly overshadowed. Ray Burris, who did not have a shutout all year, pitching the game of his year at a critical point for the Expos. And now it's on to Olympic Stadium. We thought going up into Montreal that we would have the edge. At the Big O in Olympic Stadium in Montreal, the Expos go after the Dodgers in the National League Championship Series. Steve Rogers, he's won three in a row. Steve Rogers was very consistent. To me, he had probably the best stuff I caught. And that stuff would be on full display all game long. The one-two pitch, and call strike three, the ball game is over! Steve Rogers, Ray Burris, just match the Dodgers pitch for pitch. Steve Rogers has pitched a complete game! They need just one victory, and they'll go to the World Series. But in game four, with their backs once again against the wall, the Dodger bats awaken. We were starting to feel that time was running out and uh, that we needed to accomplish our goal. Led by a Garvey homer, the Dodgers scored six runs in the last two innings to win the game going away. You couldn't buy a run and all of a sudden they're flowing in. The Dodgers did what they had to do here at Olympic Stadium. They beat the Expos and we're going to get a fifth and deciding game here for the National League pennant. There's no tomorrow for the team that comes out on the short end of this game today. Back on the hill for the Dodgers was Valenzuela. And in this start, the rookie started off shakily. Line drive, left center field. That ball is going to find the gap. This could rattle Valenzuela a little bit. Someone warming up in the bullpen already. Fernando has shown the ability to maybe start off a game not real strong, but finish at a level that was going to help you win that game. Lasorda stuck with Valenzuela, and it worked. 
as he pitched eight and two thirds of one run ball. And in the ninth, it was tied when Jim Fanning called on an unlikely reliever. The Expos closer, Jeff Reardon, was not available to pitch. He had had some back problems. So he called on Steve Rogers to come in. He had never pitched in relief. Rogers got two quick outs, but then the Expos ace had to face veteran Rick Monday. The 3-1 pitch. Swung on, fly ball, center field. I knew it was hit well, but quite frankly, I did not see the flight of the ball. I thought I hit it too high. I started to watch Andre Dawson moving into right center field. Dawson going back onto the warning track. And then he ran out of room. That ball is a home run. And the Dodgers have gone ahead 2-1. to one. It was called Blue Monday, and it'll always be remembered by Expos fans. The Dodgers and the Yankees will start tomorrow night in New York City. What a traditional series before us, the Yankees against the Dodgers. We almost felt that that was a classic World Series at the time. We had obviously played them in the past, 77, 78. The Yankees, of course, had won both those times and picked up this series where they left off. Pull sharply down third. Nettles knocks it down, comes up throwing as he starts the game with a great defensive play. Great play, Randolph. Now look what I found, one hopper for the second down. Winfield's on the ball. Say going to second. Throw comes in. He's out. The Yankees strike early on a three-run home run by Bart Watson to lead it 3-0. That lead would hold up, and the Yanks took the opener. Then came game two, and Tommy John against his old club. Tommy left Los Angeles as a free agent and came over to New York, so the Dodgers know it. They know what they have to do against him. It was like pitching in a camp game at Vero Beach because I'd seen all these guys and I'd pitched to them in all those games. The reunion favored John, who combined with Gossage on a shutout and gave the Yanks a 2-0 lead, heading west. And the pressure immediately on the Dodgers. A gorgeous early evening in Southern California. The Yankees up two games to nothing. Everybody was probably giving up on the Dodgers. They said, oh, again, those Yankees. But it had already been a special season for L.A. and their rookie phenom. Fernando Valenzuela on the mound. And it was fitting that in Game 3, the Dodgers would again be calling on Valenzuela to rescue their World Series hopes. You've heard so much, read so much about his poise despite his youth, and he's going to have a chance to prove it here now. And staked to a three-run lead early, Valenzuela went to work. Yo creo que se necesitaba ganar ese juego, entonces estuvimos uh, siempre en problemas en el juego. Siempre había corredores en base. He wasn't as sharp as usual. He had lots of trouble. Hit high in the air to deep left center field. Got and the Yankees are on top, four to three. La Soda came to the mound several times. He's struggling, isn't he? He's all right, Tom. Huh? He's all right. Tom to Santa Cansado. In muchas ocasiones, si uno no puede con un lanzamiento, entonces hay que buscar otra forma de cómo sacar de a los bateadores. As the game went on, he got very, very comfortable against a lineup that was just an extraordinary uh, lineup the Yankees had. Got to give Fernando some credit. Not too many 20-year-olds would struggle like this and still be out there. And when the Dodgers took the lead back, Valenzuela continued to battle to protect it. Valenzuela in and out of trouble all night. You know, they're totally right about this kid. There is amazing poise there. Es uno de los juegos más emocionantes, más recordados en mi carrera. This was not the best Fernando game, it was his finest. Thanks in large part to the guts of Valenzuela, the Dodgers were back in the series. But as the start of game four soon proves, momentum can be fleeting. But the Yankees now lead it six to three. Once again, the Dodgers played from behind. An uncomfortable position, maybe, but not an entirely unfamiliar one. What helped is the fact that we'd come back in both series before that against Houston and in Montreal. So the Dodgers keep trying to get up off the deck. And high in the air to right center field. Just don't hit it out. 
until someone closed the door shut on us, it really wasn't in our minds that we were going to lose again. You had to have a feeling about these Dodgers, the way they kept coming back. The Dodgers took the lead in the seventh and held on for the 8-7 win, even in the series, and reversing its tide. We let them back in, and talking about momentum shifts, you can just clearly see the momentum switch back in their direction. And we tried to stop it, but it was too late. Game five was a pitcher's duel between Ron Guidry and Jerry Royce. And the Dodgers found themselves trailing one to nothing in the seventh inning. And one batter later, the score changed again. Jerry Royce handled the rest, going all the way to earn the Dodgers the win and the edge in the series, heading back to New York. The Dodgers lead it three games to two. Last week, when the Yankees had won two in a row, it had seemed they were in total command. Question is, will they have their boys back in their home ballpark tonight? I felt that before the game even started, it was our time to win. We were in Yankee Stadium, and the fans knew it. It was quiet as could be. What a difference three days can make. Reading the media, it was a chicken team. They were dead. Some chicken team, these Dodgers. I remember the way the game progressed and the lead we had. Guerrero hits it high, hits it deep to left center field. Mumphrey on his horse, going, can't get it. The Dodgers have got the big inning going, and it's becoming a blowout. Finally, in the last inning with two outs, there's a, there's a euphoria that takes over. There are the Dodgers. This is finally the moment that you're going to be a world champion. Watson hits it high in the air. This should do it. The Dodgers for the 1981 champions of baseball. 1981 may have been a season interrupted, but beginning with Fernando Mania and ending with a Dodgers championship, it still somehow felt complete. Muchos jugadores tremendos jugadores nunca ganaron una serie mundial. Entonces para mí eso significa bastante ya que es mi primer año novato ganar una serie mundial. Es lo máximo. Though Fernando Valenzuela would never again quite reach the heights of those first weeks of his rookie season, he'd remain one of the NL's top pitchers throughout the 1980s, finishing in the top five in Cy Young voting four times. His Dodgers would make the playoffs three more times in the decade, capturing another title as Cinderella's in 1988. I don't believe what I just saw! By contrast, 1981 was a harbinger of eventual descent for the Yankees, who wouldn't make the postseason again until 1995. The Cardinals, meanwhile, would rise to win the NL East the next year, and then prevail over the Brewers in the 82 World Series. That's the winner! Baseball had paused in the summer of 81, but returned to showcase in October unlike any other.